So we're excited to be here with you tonight to learn about your clean energy priorities and also to discuss a critical component to achieving our clean, clean energy goals and realizing the full benefits of these investments, which is transmission. We will discuss what energy transmission is, why it matters to your respective work, the big issues in this space, possible mitigation measures that we can advocate for, and what National Wildlife Federation is currently doing as a part of our transmission initiative. So what is energy transmission? Just to make sure that we are all on the same page, energy transmission is the highway, you can think of it as, moving energy, and generation is the resource that's creating that energy. And this is an important distinction because how developers make money off of these projects differs, as does the siting processes for these projects. And they're normally discussed together because they inform one another, and it is important that they are built simultaneously. So why does it matter? Energy transmission really is the key to expanding clean energy use and access, and transmission infrastructure stands to be the largest infrastructure investment and build out of this century. We know that expanding the use of clean energy will improve the health of our communities, increase the grid's resiliency and reliability, especially during extreme weather. It will also lower electric bills and protect wildlife and natural resources. And without it, we cannot meet our climate goals. And it is impossible for us to build enough generation quickly enough to meet our climate goals and prevent the earth from increasing in temperature even more. Now it is possible for us to build out transmission infrastructure and it must occur at significantly more than our current rate. Traditionally, states hold jurisdiction in siting transmission projects. Now, when I say states, I typically mean state agencies, but notably many counties and municipalities also have permitting processes that determine whether a project will move forward, which I suspect a lot of you know well. Now, the federal government may emphasize emphasis on this discretionary authority, provide a permit if the project is cited in what is called a national interest corridor, which is designated by the Department of Energy. And this typically happens every three years. Uh, it, there are a number of environmental factors that any permitting entity must consider. And one of which is the project's impacts to wildlife and our natural resources. Now, transmission projects can cause significant habitat fragmentation if cited improperly. As you can see in this picture, there is a large amount of clearing that must occur for fire and safety reasons because the cables are live wires. So that means that they can't touch anything around them. And this means that there is significantly less coverage for smaller wildlife that typically use ground shrubbery for protection from predators. There are also less food resources for nearby wildlife, and there's also less options for shelter and many other uh, negative consequences. And this is also especially relevant given a new study from the Nature Serve that found that right now, right now, one third of all species that are known of flora, fauna, and wildlife are at risk of extinction, not endangered, not vulnerable, at risk of extinction. Just let that, just let that it, process that for a minute. It, it shocked me when I first heard of it too, one third of all species. And of course, we cannot forget about the human impacts to siting transmission projects, right? Which includes the protection of cultural heritage and archeological sites. And this is undoubtedly an issue that all of you will encounter if you have not already in the siting of these projects. And all of this is to say that why, why it is so important to be a part of the early design of these projects with your local utilities and developers is so important because your local communities deserve to gain the benefits from these projects, but you also have a right to say where these projects will be located. So how can you ensure that the least amount of impacts occur from these projects? Well, going back to what I just said, you can advocate for the design of and where these projects can be located. And some of the preferred sites include along already disturbed areas of land, such as along highways, brownfields, 
former industrial sites and existing rights of way. But don't just stop there because impacts don't just come from the location of the project. How that location is treated can also have long lasting impacts in the construction and post-construction phases of the project. And here, this may include ensuring that during the construction phase, construction workers stack soils so that they have, so that they, when they are dug up, they're in the order that they found them, so that once metal is in the ground, the soils can then be put back in the right order. In the post construction phase, remember all of that habitat fragmentation that I discussed earlier? Well, you can advocate to have pollinators and native plant species planted at the site of the project to provide protection for small ground prey species and ensure that there is some food sources for wildlife. And we're asking you all to help the build the relationships that you already have with your communities with these developers so that their priorities are at the forefront of all of the decision making that occurs with these projects. And you really need to know two things. One, all these mitigation measures we discussed will have a huge effects on local communities by ensuring that their environments retain or even gain biodiversity. They can access, they can gain access to clean energy and have better health outcomes. And the community agreements with developers can ensure that notable job growth occurs, which can build monetary equity into a lot of our communities. So here is a list of important upcoming projects. So what what can we do as you know, just common people or um you know, just citizens and, and community leaders and elected officials, what more can we do to um, kind of push this renewable energy um, along and, you know, provide more opportunities for things to happen in our communities? Yeah, that's a great question, Max. So in the transmission space, because I recognize it's more of a technical topic, if you can talk to your local uh, and state uh, congressional members, in addition to your utilities, quite frankly, to tell them that you want them to invest in clean energy, uh, that is one avenue, especially given the fact that there are so many different grant programs that are out now that are available not only for utilities themselves and developers, but also for communities th themselves who can apply for them. And maybe, David, do you have a bit more that you can share on uh, BIL and IRA there? As, as I mentioned, both of those bills have various different um, investment funding opportunities, and some of them are, are available for local communities to, you know, put up community solar, for instance, or, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of rural development money also to help communities transition coal power plants into renewable generation instead. So like in New Mexico, there's a bunch of rural electrical co-ops um, and and I guess just like any other state, I'm sure Arizona and, and Colorado have many. Um, how how can we maybe bridge that engagement gap for some of these co-ops to start considering um, either transitioning or adding to their to their existing uh, infrastructure uh, some renewable ener energy generation. Uh, systems or or things like that how like is there something that that um that we can provide even if it's just information of where um where the money is and, and, and some opportunities for some of the other rural electrical co-ops yeah the the inflation reduction act included um 9.7 billion dollars specifically for renewable uh, co-ops to transition their energy systems. So, um, and I, I believe that that funding opportunity has already been announced by USDA. Here in Santa Fe, at, it's not uncommon for our local government to be at odds with our state policy. Um, but one of the things that you talked about was, or that you mentioned was that, um, I think you said it was new that a state denial triggers federal, federal review process. Is that just denial at the state level, or is that something that um, trickles down to the local level? That's a great question, Carmichael. So at the moment, 
that has not been litigated or decided from an initial reading, like as an attorney, I would say it's at the state agency level. So at like your agency of natural resource type of level, uh, not at the municipality or the county level, but in the past, county and municipal level uh, denials of permits have prevented projects from moving forward. So the the word <laughs> the use of the word state, I think it is a little bit broad and has not been officially like legally determined yet, but that's my initial read on, on the statute right now. And that's what the uh, rulemaking at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is also looking to clarify. I had a question about... Um on the clean energy, um, the the overview um, that was sent out, um, the transmission facilitation program, um, I wondered, because it's managed by DOE um, and the only eligible entities are utilities, developers, co-ops, et cetera, um, how much do you work locally with Excel Energy in educating them, you know, in Colorado around these opportunities or the desire um, through your membership to have them explore um, more of these opportunities? That's a good question. I actually haven't heard of any of our affiliates specifically working with Excel, but I know in New England, some of our affiliates up there have worked with some of the uh, some of the larger utilities like Eversource and what have you. And they actually got a bunch of utilities to put together a, uh, a concept paper together, like a bunch of different utilities from different states to apply for a grant and they actually got it. So that's an indicator for the rest of you in different states that DOE is specifically prioritizing projects where states are coming together to apply for projects, just so that they can ensure that the reliability and the capacity aspects of the project are really serving everyone and not just a select group of people, which is a positive step forward. This is Jeronimo Vasquez from Coconino County. Uh, let me see. My, so my question, my first one is about rural transportation and renewal co-ops. Um, I represent uh, an urban and rural district, but today we had a, a big milestone in our county or in our community. We had our, we out, we had our first electric bus that went online today. So that was really cool. And uh, so as you're talking through this and, you're, and I'm listening to and I'm hearing about renewable, um, what is it called? Renewable co-ops, co was it? renewable co-ops and renewable energy systems. I'm curious to see what kind of funding of, is available to help expand that kind of, uh, those kind of connections, because, uh, you know, we're looking, our, uh, locally, we, we're already transitioning in the community to 100% electric uh, vehicle fleet uh, down the road. We got our first one today and we have funding for four more, um, but, the area that we have lacking or we need support in that would be helpful is the rural transportation because we have several communities, including several um, native communities on the reservation that we are currently working on to provide more bus service to those locales. Yeah, and, uh, and so it occurs to me that if we can tap into some of these renewable energy systems uh, funding opportunities, that could be really helpful and impactful for uh, not uh, for for Coconino County and in and Northern Arizona as we're building out this rural transportation infrastructure. Yeah, thank you for that question. I know that in the in IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, there is a tax credit for EVs. I also know mm -hmm. separately there is a program. Uh, I think it's from a mix of IRA and BIL that's specifically for rural communities that allocates something like one billion dollars to investments uh, that can come from a variety of uh, of sources. It can be generating from solar. Uh, it can be generating from wind. It can be uh, EV infrastructure. I think is another one of them, and uh, it, transmission is another component too. I think the the overall category is like reliability. So there's a lot of different technologies that you can make the case that can fit under that category, which is a good thing. Whether there are any environmental justice issues that you are particularly concerned about in each of your communities. I can go if no one else wants to. Uh, for us, it's uh, 
I mentioned earlier, the Grand Canyon, uh, Grand Canyon protecting the Grand Canyon watershed is is super important. Uh, we have several native tribes that are impacted directly. And then plus just the watershed itself, how many folks in, in Coconino County that it impacts. And so uh, that's one of my priorities is, is uh, in particular uranium mining. I know that the transition from coal to clean energy is tough. Here in New Mexico, we've got the San Juan um, uh, coal plant that has just kind of been in the news a lot lately. And, um, you know, I, I commend everyone who's, been working on that to, to make that happen one way or the other, because it's just a, a tough issue. Um, more specifically, one of the things that ECHO is working on is um, the uh, Caja de Rio um, protections. And one of the things that has been proposed is um, transmission line or a couple of transmission line alignments right through the Caja. And one of the uh, slides, you talked about some mitigation <clears throat> and one was to make sure that um, these transmission lines are, or new new lines are located in existing rights. Um, and I'm just wondering if there's, I mean, if there's a, uh, I'm not even quite sure how this is, but the priority in those mitigations, like, is, is uh, using existing right of way kind of go on the priority list? Um, are they prioritized at all? That's a good That's question. A so for any type of siting, if you can put it on disturbed areas of land, so areas of land that are already being used for something else as like the priority or as the preferred sites is generally what we've been advocating for. That being said though, in some instances where the, there are those, ex, those existing rights of ways or there already is that infrastructure, sometimes that's already in overburdened communities and we don't want to overburden those already overburdened communities, right? So then that's when you would say that maybe this isn't the right place to put it. Another question for everyone to think about on this call and for something for you all to advocate for with your utilities is for them to upgrade their existing transmission infrastructure first before they talk about build out. Because if they if they upgrade their existing infrastructure first, they can minimize the amount of build out that has to happen, right? Because they're able to transmit more energy uh, using what they already have essentially. And not all utilities are doing this. And this is largely because of the uh, the structure, they, they call it rate making that they have that where they put a price per kilowatt hour on, on electricity. Uh, and because the way that process is currently set up, utilities typically make more money by building new infrastructure as opposed to upgrading and then building. But that's a huge uh, a, a huge component to what you actually see on your electric bill, because when utilities are upgrading their lines, uh, you don't see that because that's considered operation and maintenance versus when they uh, build brand new, you see that because that cost is passed through to you as electric consumers. Um, it's considered a capital cost that they're allowed to make money off of. So definitely in these conversations, in addition to just asking where the project is going, it's also important to ask, like, how did you decide that this build out, like the size of build out was proper in this case? Was it really needed or was it just that you wanted to capitalize on your on your uh, infrastructure? <laughs> Thank you. I, I have actually occurred to me another question. It's not related to Coconino County, but just in general. Uh, and California, I know, has had some serious issues with power lines. Um, is there are there communities that we can help? How can we support folks and communities in California and other places in the country, or at least in the Southwest region, uh, around um, around those power lines and? and making sure that that there is that clearance. I know it's disruptive to the native life, but you know, we want one, we want to make that transition, but for lines that still have to be there because we can't get rid of all of them yet. Hopefully eventually we can, but it, that's going to be a process and a long-term process, not an, a quick fix. The immediate fix right or the immediate need right now 
Uh, it's not so much in our county, but we're affected by as well as wildfire. You know, and power lines, I mean, I was talking to my uncle the other day, and he lives in Northern California, and he's like PG&E. You know, that's synonymous with wildfire in California. The, what happened with PG&E is exactly because of what I was talking about. They didn't upgrade their mm-hmm. existing lines, and they allowed that infrastructure to get really, really old, such that it broke, right? And then that's part of the reason why the wildfire happened, because the lines made contact with the ground. And of course, because they're live fires, that caught on fire, and then that spiraled into that catastrophe. So it, um, it, once again, to reiterate just the importance of upgrading the existing infrastructure, the majority of the infrastructure in the United States has not been upgraded since about the 1980s, 1970s, 1980s. And that's a long time, especially given all of the technological advancements that have been made that not only not only can replace the existing lines, but also improve the way that they are used such that during severe weather events, whether it be a blizzard in New England or it's a um, really hot summer in Arizona, they can shift the load so that they don't have to incur rolling blackouts, right? Because that is another huge problem with uh, with the power grid right now. Uh, one I wanted to tie in with the, the discussion of the wildfire, Veronica, if you're not familiar, I, I, I introduced myself being from Las Vegas. We have several members from Las Vegas, New Mexico, and certainly we've had to deal with the catastrophic wildfire that diminished a lot of our, 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 our forest here. We, we lost almost a half million acres in in the fire a three-month fire from last spring uh and not not out of irony but many of the homes that you know were were devastated by the fire relied on those forests and the timber industry for fuel wood for for energy costs and so consequently you know many many of the homes are are for lack right now of, of that energy resource and because there are certainly some reparations that are going to be coming into place, and and our our congressional delegation has been forefront in it, being trying trying to be not only a reparation, but as an economic development uh, direction, so as to to replace the economies of these communities that were impacted. And I think to some degree, to the, to the degree that we could look at the generative energy aspects and not just the transmission, replacing old lines. We're really looking at uh, unique generative capabilities so that there's a longstanding um, production that's coming out of these communities as well. So more, more, more of a comment rather than a question, but I, I, I'm hoping, and certainly Janice and Max, you know, they're, they're elected officials representing us as well. And I think to some degree, and you're sharing the resources and the, the network, the conduits for that, that information is to being part of local decision making, I think that's a valuable tool so that there is truly community representation in decision making. Absolutely. Thank you for uplifting that point, Eric. It's so important to this conversation. And I just want to highlight, too, that the only reason that we're having this transmission conversation and not a microgrid conversation is because not every state is fortunate enough to either have the financial incentives or the political will to allow that generation to be built, right? The majority of generation, uh, at least scientifically speaking, will come from the middle of the United States and then certainly parts of the Southwest too, I know are great candidates. Uh, But then for the rest of the states surrounding them, they don't have as much generating capacity, you know, or they don't have the political will that's allowing projects to even be built or even considered in their states. And that's where transmission comes into this conversation. So that when you think of it nationally, or even regionally, when you're thinking about the power grid, to make sure that essentially nobody gets left behind, and everyone can be a part of this transition, so that you don't have Uh, rural communities in like Idaho, for instance, that don't have access to that generation, but then are stuck with coal, but then the coal phases out and then they have nothing, right? So it's a matter of just making sure that everyone is brought along on this conversation. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We'll definitely be continuing this series of, of meetings. And thanks again.